Hello, welcome to Stories in Time. My name is Eloise Schottler. I'm the storyteller. You know, people ask me, where do you find stories? And some of them I make up. I think back over memories in my life and I make a story up or I overhear something in an elevator or I'm just paying attention and I have to adapt it into a story, not copy somebody else's story, of course. But there are other ways that I started storytelling through genealogy. And genealogy introduced me to the fabulous files that they have in libraries, that they have where they've collected things from families. It's been given over to them. And it's the letters that I am in love with. So every time I go someplace or I have a chance, I just sit down in front of files of letters and I'll find stories. You don't know that in your own family. There are stories locked in the letters. If the person was a good letter writer, then you're bound to have stories when you start reading old letters. I started reading old letters last night because I was cleaning out a file, a filing system I have at home. It's really not necessary for me to keep six or seven copies of the same story or the same thing I'm clearing out. And so I was reading back through, and I decided that I would bring in two letters that I really like a lot and that there are stories in them and I would read them to you. I wasn't going to sit down. It takes me days to memorize them so that I would just share the story with you and maybe out of that you will think about the possibility of whether or not you have letters in your family or for a friend that would give you a story you don't quite know or that you would like to know about. These are about 50 to 60 years apart. That's also why I like that. They're both from the South. I'm from the South, and these are both from North Carolina. <clears throat> the first letter I'm going to read you is from the library at Winthrop College in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And a family, the Ramsey family, had given over some letters into the library. And one day I was sitting in the library and suggested that I just sort of dig down into the files, and I did. This letter was written September the 9th, 1893. It's addressed to Miss Lula Gray in Mooresville, North Carolina, the opening. My dear great-granddaughter, you desire me to write out a history of our family. I regret that I know so little compared with what I might have learned from my grandfather. At the time when he was capable of affording me information, I was more interested in pocket knives and fish hooks than family history. When I arrived at an age when the history of my family would have been more interesting my grandfather had fallen into a childish state and was incapable of giving such information about anything of a worldly nature. And he goes on with a lot of facts and what, and then he tell, tells this. My grandmother was a thorough Presbyterian. If you know North Carolina, you know that's important. My grandmother was a thorough Presbyterian. She was quite a doctor in many ailments, especially in cases peculiar to women. On Saturday, she baked all the bread, pies, and custards needed on Sunday in a large brick oven. She could make the most curious things out of the dough to please the children than anyone else, such as ducks sitting on their necks, and terrapins with their feet spread out, crawling, and the like. She could take a frying pan with a long handle and turn the cakes by tossing them up and catching them in the pan. Grandma died a few years before Grandfather. 
I think they were aged about 80 years old. All their children, my uncles, my aunts, were Presbyterians. I never heard of one of them being called up before court, church, or state to give an account of misdemeanor or unchristian conduct. Finally, he winds down and concludes the letter. He, you see, that there were no great ones among our ancestors. They were all in common walks of life, no blue-blooded ancestry, but just upright, high-minded, honorable men and women. If there were no great ones among them, there were none of whom we were, afraid, were ashamed. It signed James Parks. Somewhere in the Parks line, I come down that line. I don't know him, don't know where he was, but we all look at that last paragraph and want to be proud of our families, or at least not have any scathingly embarrassing stories to tell about them. So it's locked up in there. You can see there are three stories. Something about him and his aging. Something about how he remembers his, his grandmother. His grandmother. The things she cooked, the things she could do, and the things she took care of. And then the family has been passed down some very good stories about their ancestors, if he can end a letter like that. I went for a, a visit to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and so I went over uh, to Winthrop again. And she said, you know, why don't you just dig in to the files? There are some new family files. And I did. And this one I particularly like, so I kept it. It was written Thursday, November the 28th, 1940. 40, 50-some years later than the story from James Parks. It was a birthday greeting to Aura Deer, her sister Aura. The older sister writes to the younger sister. How well I remember November the 28th in 1895. November the 27th was a wash day. Mother always made the starch and helped Myrtle and me get at the big task. But on this day, she sent us along by ourselves. Even though we were 12 and 14, we were not supposed to even suspect what was going to happen. Albert, our brother, did not go to school either. He would be needed about nine o'clock, he saddled a horse and galloped away. Myrtle and I were hanging out the first boiling, each sheet and garment freezing and fluttering in the breeze as we hung them on the line. When Albert returned with old Doc Richardson, who had been working in the fields of his farm. Much, much later, when all the Washington was put out, the evening chores were done, supper was cooked, dishes cleared away, and the children were settled in their places up in my room. I remember going to bed, but I didn't sleep much. We could hear Mama as she struggled with her suffering in the bedroom downstairs. The next morning, November the 28th, Dad woke Myrtle and me early. We fixed a nice breakfast, ham eggs, or maybe it was sausage and eggs, biscuits and coffee, jam and preserves. We fed the children and then we waited and waited and waited. Finally, about 9.30 a.m., old Mrs. Gray came out of the room and told me, you've got a little baby sister. Myrtle and I were overjoyed. We did not get to go into the room until about noon. I can still see Mama's sweet face today. She told us we almost lost our mother this morning, and she urged us to look after everything and take care of the children. I turned and rushed out of the room and went out to the latticed shed 
where I cried and cried and cried. On December the 11th, Mama fell asleep quietly and peacefully. Myrtle and I had to assume great responsibilities then during her illness and after she died. I often think of the many struggles we all had together and how those struggles brought us closer together and how we loved our baby sister. We were so happy when she came home from Grandmother Shira's. I can, in my imagination, see her, a seven-month-old baby in her little pink dress with a bonnet to match, sitting in the buggy with Myrtle and Dad. Not until I was a mother and a grandmother did I realize how hard it must have been for Grandma Shira to let that precious baby go home. Today, we still love that child who grew up happily into her girlhood and then to her young womanhood and now to mature womanhood at 45 years old. Happy birthday, dear sister. Love, bye. How could you resist the stories locked up in this letter of the lives that were lived on a farm outside Rock Hill, South Carolina? Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.